All right. Mics are hot. Excellent. Still in the red. That's okay. <laughs> Are you ready? <clears throat> Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Avery Research Center for African American History and Culture. My name is Eric Cavill, and I am the Research Archivist and Interpretation Coordinator at Avery. I just want to welcome you to the space. Have y'all been to Avery before? First, some of y'all first timers, okay. Oh, well, for those who don't know, Avery began as a school for African-Americans in 1865. And this was a place for Black Charleston to receive a really high quality education. It was also a safe and radical organizing space for Black Charlestonians. And it operated as a school for about 89 years, closed down in 1954. And in the late 70s, Avery graduates got together to save, save this building from developers and they negotiated a relationship with the College of Charleston, which was just a few blocks away. And the Avery Research Center for African-American History and Culture was born. And today we are a staff of about seven full-timers and we have some, some grant positions and student employees from the College of Charleston who support us. And we are building on the legacy of black education and uh, create, providing a, a radical, safe organizing space for, for black organizers in the community. So. This program is an example of the types of educational programs that we offer the community. And um, it kind of came about as a result of some of my personal uh, studies in trying to reconnect with my ancestral language, which is Louisiana Creole. So my teachers here will introduce everyone in a minute. And I've been taking Louisiana Creole language classes since March and um, learning a lot about the efforts by the language activists and their colleagues who are present today to preserve Louisiana Creole and create a writing system for Louisiana Creole as a part of those preservation efforts. And I'm familiar with the work of the Sea Island Translation team, some of them, some of whom are present today, and their 20 plus year pro uh, process of translating the, the Bible into Gullah Geechee language. And even though at this point, Gullah Geechee is not considered a written language, I thought, well, they've laid the foundation with the work that they've done to create a writing system for Gullah Geechee. So why not bring these two groups of work language activists together uh, in order to see what it might look like to create a, a writing system for Gullah Geechee. So with that said, I'm going to hand the mic over to our moderator today, Akua Page, who is a language activist from North Charleston, who also a former educator, who's been doing great work in the community to promote Gullah Geechee language for what it is, the only English-based Creole language in North America, and also connecting Gullah Geechee with other English-based Creole languages across the diaspora. So I'll turn it over to Akua, thank you. <coughs> Good morning, everybody. How y'all doing today? Good. Hello. All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. Madam, I'm going to need that. <laughs> so thank y'all for joining us today. The first person we're going to introduce is Clifford St. Laurent. Clifford is a multi-hyphenated artist, producer, educator, and Louisiana Creole culture activist. In the early 2000s, he began studying linguistics independently and has since become one of the one of the foremost experts in Louisiana Creole, specializing in Kurivani, Louisiana endangered Creole language. Thank you for joining us today. Thanks for having me. Next up is Oliver Mayu. Mayor? Oliver completed his PhD thesis, which examined variations and change in Louisiana Creole at the University of Cambridge in 2019. He remains in Cambridge and is currently a Title A fellow at Trinity College, and he has Louisiana roots and grew up in Scotland and Nigeria. Thank you for joining us today. Next up, we have Adrian Guillory Chapman. She's a heritage language activist born in Lafayette, Louisiana, and raised in Chicago, Illinois. Although as a young child in Chicago, Adrian's elders spoke Louisiana French and Kuru Vani. Adrian learned it later in life. She, along with other activists, has created 
a lot of learning resources, including videos, information, including the a Louisiana Creole Learning, a learner's guide to Louisiana Creole second edition. Thank you for joining us, Adrian. Next up, we have Mr. Ron Days. Ron is a son of St. Helena, South Carolina. He is an author, performing artist, educator, and culture interpreter. His productions and recordings about Gullah heritage began after his publication of his first book, Reminiscence of Sea Island Heritage in 1986. Most of y'all may have known him as Mr. Ron from Gullah Island, the Nick Jr. TV award-winning children's program in 1990s. He is also the former chairman of the Gullah Geechee Heritage Corridor Commission and a charter member of the Sea Island Translation Team and Literacy Project, which translated the Gullah Bible. Thank you, Mr. Ron, for joining us today. To Last but not least, Mr. Emery Shaw Campbell. He was born and raised on Hilton Head Island, South Carolina, and he received a class valedictorian in in the 1960s, in 1965, he's earned his Bachelor of Science degree in biology, and he also earned his MS in environmental engineering, where he utilized that to focus on the lives of the Sea Island people, and his goal is to inform and discuss methods of preserving and enhancing the unique and rich cultural heritage and environmental heritage facing the development on the Sea Islands. Thank you, Mr. Campbell, for joining us today. Next up, we're going to dive into some of these questions that we have for our panel. The first one is for Mr. Ron. Can you briefly discuss the process of translating the New Testament of the Bible? Well, the process uh, included assembling a team, and the team included linguists, uh, they were part of the Wycliffe Bible Translators Group and uh, also assembling uh, community members who were well versed in speaking uh, Gullah, known today as Gullah Geechee. Uh, the one of the uh, concerns of the community members as well as of the linguists was to uh, make sure that com other community members knew the value of this language because for years it was considered bad English, broken English, substandard English. And there were numerous community members wanting, wanting to know just why was this being done? What was the value of it? Um, and uh, the linguist, one of the things for me, the linguist taught us the different, the grammatical rules, the structure of the language um, and it was at that time we learned about Lorenzo Dow Turner's research that a lot of the words that were considered uh, Gullah or Geechee were based in West African languages. The linguists uh, also wanted to make sure that they were creating not just a transliteration, but a translation of the Bible. So there was the need to uh, go back to the original Greek and then to make sure that whatever um, translations were thought would fit best over a widespread uh, group as it's now known, uh, the Gullah Geechee Cultural Heritage Corridor spans from Wilmington, North Carolina, down the Southeast Coast, all the way to St. Augustine, Florida. And there were differences in words that were used and pronunciations but we wanted to make sure that there was a commonality that everyone could understand. Briefly, I think that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that. The next question that we have, Mr. Ron, is what are some of the problems or challenges you encounter when translating the New Testament? Well, uh, one of my major um, ways, activities, with the translation team was to do oral presentations of whatever draft of the scriptures had been translated. And this was a way of testing to make sure that everyone understood what had been read. Um, another uh, concern was that after the 20 some years when the, um, the Gullah Bible was 
completed, it was found that many um, community members were so pleased to have this written document, but they could not read it because it had been an oral language. They could understand it whenever it was spoken, or there were community members, oh no, we would not use that word. We would use this one. For instance, for the, um, uh, in the translation of the Christmas story, um, I think one of the terms originally, uh, when um, Mary became uh, pregnant, was that she'd been big, which mm -hmm. I could really understand, but so that was too common an expression. Um, another t um, term that had been tossed about was she been make foot for socks. And that was understood, you're making feet for socks. Mm -hmm. But uh, what had been selected was she have child, <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> which was better understood. So those were some of the uh, challenges in uh, creating the translation. But overall, it was to ensure that people could readily understand the written word of God. Thank you, Mr. Ron. Now, Mr. Emery, I'm gonna ask you the same question. Can you briefly just discuss the process of translating the New Testament of the Bible? Hello, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Well, the process was pretty much a very, very simple process where we would read and then we would um, would read in English and then we would have Gala speakers and try to try to translate it in Gala. Now how would you say that in Gala? And in my case we we would remember how grandmother talked because we try to go back as far as we could. When I grew up um, Gullah was a bad thing, like as Ron said, you didn't you didn't speak it. You, you were reluctant to uh, to speak it in public. You spoke it at home. And when I became director of Penn Center, that reinforced my reluctance because Penn Center was like Avery, you know, teaching Gullah people how to become mainstream Americans and how to speak the correct English. And you did not speak Gullah after Penn School. And so when the, when the translators came to, to Penn Center to begin work, I was reluctant. I didn't even join them. This project began at Penn Center. And the project before then was a project to teach Gullah kids how to speak English. And that project started in 1979, 1978. Hill and Head Island wanted workers. The director of Penn Center said, gee, these Gullah kids need to learn how to speak English. Mm. So he got a grant from the Department of Labor to teach Gullah kids how to speak English. As a second language. As a second language. Second language. And, um, mm. And so the, Rick, the Wycliffe Bible people saw that in the newspaper. I think it hit the New York Times even, that this project was teaching Gullah kids a second language. And the Wycliffe Bible kids, kids, I mean, people came down and said, gee, we got to save that language. And, and so they came down and Claude and, Claude and Pat Sharp, and we ignored, I ignored them because I was director of Penn Center. <laughs> we, weren't gonna, we weren't gonna enforce something that Penn Center had condemned all these years. We weren't gonna take a part of that. And so I ignored them until about 1981. They had been there about two years working. Ron might have joined them before me. I think you were on, man. I, I was on, okay. So this professor came from University of California. And he wanted me to introduce him to Gullah speakers. And I said to him, you came to the wrong place. <laughs> this is Penn School. We don't, we don't perpetuate Gullah, Gullah language. 
Mm. I said, but I could take you to a senior citizen center <clears throat> and maybe you can hear it spoken there. And I took him over. I escorted him over to the senior citizen center and they began talking to one another. And he was asking them questions. Would you say that in Gullah? And, and those folks were spontaneously responding. These were people my age then. I'm 82. These were people from 70 to 80 years old, knowing the Gullah language. And so he said to me after the session, you need to go and join those translators. And I hastily did that. And for the next 25 years, that's what I did, uh, worked with uh, translators. And the translators were, they were pretty much expert at, 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 uh, at non-traditional language, uh, language, you know, indigenous languages. And they taught me a lot. And so we would sit and we would read a passage and we Gullah speakers would reinterpret how, what the passage would, would say. Most of us spoke Gullah readily, but some of us like myself had to recall, how is it, how would my grandmother have said that? I was just talking to Mama Dunk this morning and she was talking about her grandmother. And I learned Gullah from my grandparents because my parents were school teachers. And so I had to recall how my grandmother would say something, how my grandfather would say something. And, uh, <clears throat> but, but we had people like Renetta and uh, what's her name? Ardell. Ardell. And Irving Green. And Irving Green. These, those were, uh, these were the main Gullah speakers. They spoke Gullah fluently. I, I just envied them because they, they were from the county beyond the Sea Islands. And, you know, we think that the Sea Islands are the only place where Gullah, sp Gullah is spoken, but you go even 30 miles from the shorelines and, and you find people there that are speaking fluent Gullah. And I was really impressed and satisfied to have those three people with us. So we would read passages and we would uh, reinterpret them in Gullah. And we did that painfully every, like, you know, twice a month, sitting around like we're doing now. Thank you, Mr. Emery, for sharing your wisdom with us. We'd also like to know, what do you think is at stake if Gullah language reaches endangered status? Oh. I think I think we we're going to have Gullah speakers around for another generation. It's going to be changed, but the uh, the students of these schools are going to hear Gullah at home and in their environment for years to come. And unless our teachers understand the language and the language pattern, they're not gonna be able to teach, I mean, successfully teach English to these students. And I think that's why it's so important to, uh, to preserve the language and to teach it to our educators because uh, many of us, particularly since desegregation, desegregation uh, was, was a time when we came together and began to understand one another. And I think of many of our children uh, got the wrong kind of grades, got placed in the wrong systems because they were misunderstood in terms of their ability. It was a language barrier between them and their teachers. And these were teachers who were black as well as white teachers because black mainlanders also do not understand 
Tagalog language. Thank you for sharing that. Mr. Ron, I'm going to ask you the same question. What do you think is at stake if Galagichi language reaches endangered status? If Galagichi language reaches an, uh, an endangered status, it would result in the loss of a culture. Uh, culture is the way that people live from day to day. And speech way is just a way of self-identification. Um, as a uh, uh, Mr. Campbell uh, just stated, um, teachers, community members on St. Helena Island, because that's my home place, mm -hmm. and my parents, both of them were graduates of the 1933 uh, class of Penn School. Mm -hmm. We could not speak Gullah in our, our homes. Uh, we would always be corrected. Um, my, when, uh, the news broke in the, in the New York Times mm -hmm. about the translation work, and there were uh, reporters coming to Beaufort County. Mm -hmm. And my uh, my mother's sister, also a graduate of Penn School, was asked uh, if people spoke Gullah, and she said, "No, mm -hmm. we do not speak that way here." But I heard Gullah spoken all throughout the community, um, on the school bus, at church, et cetera. Uh, my mother had become a part of the Sea Island translation team. Mm -hmm. And after I had graduated from Hampton, and Re Hampton Institute and returned home, um, and I worked at one of the neighboring resorts as a resort islands as a waiter. And I came home one night and there was a translation um, written. I don't know, remember what scripture it was. But I picked it up and I read it easily because I understood it. Mm -hmm. While at Hampton, I would tell people, you know, because they were wanting to find out. And I would, I had a way of talking to them, well, giving them some examples like, who that? Who that over there? Who that over there to do that? <laughs> and I'd explain what that means. But um, today, uh, because of young adults, there is a difference in the acceptance of the language because of the work that you Akua, um, and others are doing to show that uh, it, this, this, is, this is real, this is who we are. And it, it, it didn't start during, during the period of slavery. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's because of our West African heritage. <laughs> One of the things that were very um, important to me was that the linguists of the translation team said that there was no need to use apostrophes like <laughs> D-A-T, because a grammatical rule, if a um, T-H um, is substituted with a D when speaking Gullah Geechee. Mm -hmm. So uh, that would be that. And if you want to say that's D-A-T-S, mm -hmm. not D-A-T apostrophe S, mm -hmm. which um, others of um, an earlier period, and that was like broken English. Mm -hmm. That's a bad way of speech. But when I saw D-A-T-S, it's like, oh, it's not broken English not at all. <laughs> um, <Gosh>. And <laughs> that's right. <laughs> and um, so, there is an uplift in the acceptance and the understanding of the origins of our speech way. And there are youths. Uh, there are now um, uh, people who communicate in social media. Um, they text a Galagichi expression. That had never been done before because you had to, you had, you had to stay away from that. And, um, uh, another thing is when N my wife Natalie and I, and we did performances in schools, et cetera, and this is over 15 years ago, we had done a school and we read uh, or, you know, we'd spoken Gullah, told a story in Gullah and a student, both the teacher came up afterwards. Now it was a white teacher. Um, this was in mid-state Columbia, came up and she said, that was such a great presentation and the student said oh she just loved it that's the way that her grandmother speaks she wants to learn do she wants to do some writings in Gullah um like that and the teachers oh no 
you don't want to do that. <laughs> she just course corrected what she had just said. No. Um, and as far, another thing, uh, thought that it will not be extinguished at all. Now, Joseph Apollo was one of the original persons who showed the connections of Gullah Geechee heritage with West African heritage, primarily from Sierra Leone and the Creole, K-R-I-O language spoken in Sierra Leone. And one of the documentaries that he wrote was the language you cry in. You cry in the language of your birth. And I spoke about my mother before being a graduate of Penn School, and we were not allowed to speak a certain way in our homes. Now, my mother lived to be age 101. Uh, she was just about to cross to 102. But the older she got, the color come out. <laughs> <laughs> she was a church. <laughs> <laughs> and mm -hmm. so it's, it, it, it would not even have died in her. Yeah. And as Emma said, it's evolving. So I don't think it's dying, but it is changing. And the acceptance is much greater today than it had been during my childhood. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Ron. I want to jump in real quick. Uh, thank you, Akua, for giving me this opportunity to just jump in. Last night uh, when we had our panel on Crayoli Tay, we got into some great conversations and I asked the panelists if they would give us an example of the language of Kudivini, Louisiana Creole. So I'm gonna ask y'all the same thing, Kua. I'd also like you to participate. Um, if you don't mind, just maybe, you know, talk about what your plans are for after this afternoon after the workshop shop is over. So you Whoever want to give to an example? Yeah, like, okay. yeah, asking about, what you gonna do this afternoon? You wanna get lunch? You know, just a little brief conversation. <laughs> what you for do when we done ya? Oh no, not to me. <laughs> <laughs> I can't respond. <laughs> what you for do when we done ya? With this, with this at the table. Man, I don't know. I, I, I might, I would get some bill. Oh, you gonna get some belly? You gonna bust up your belly? Yeah, yeah bust up your belly. <laughs> <laughs> you'll be hungry. Oh, and then you're gonna nyam. Nyam. Well, nyam. Nyam them up. Nyam. 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 Me, 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 to, me to do the same thing. Yeah. And we're gonna talk, but what the next thing everybody can try for do to make the language live. Live. Live on. Live. Live on. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> What we said. <laughs> I would say after here, I'm, my stomach is already in my back because I had missed breakfast. So after here, I'm going to get some busting food, probably from my three sons or the new African restaurant that just opened up. And I do want to point out, busting is not a TikTok word. It is a Gullah Geechee word that means something is delicious. <laughs> my grandmother used to word used to use the word vittle all the time, vittle, and. It's actually a biblical term. Mm -hmm. I, I, I never knew why she used that word. So, yeah. Uh, so come on, get on a fiddle. <laughs> Una, come on, get on a fiddle. Una, mm -hmm. come get your fiddle. Come get your food. Una, as well, Una, una Gadu una. is um, a Gullah Geechee expression for you as a singular plural or possessive pronoun, mm -hmm. which comes from Unu. Mm -hmm. An Igbo word from West Africa. And because there are differences in word choices throughout the Gullah Geechee corridor, we're familiar on St. Helen Island of saying Ona in Charleston or Charleston. <coughs> you might hear Ona. Now, further up the road mm -hmm. or further up the road in Georgetown or Kama, you may hear Yona. Yeah. How Yona to do? Yeah. But Ona, Ona, and Yona all come from the same root word. Unu. And we're glad for see Una. We're glad for see Una. We're glad to see you. That fa is always a two. Fa. And what Una da do, what Una da do when we, we, um, when we finish with what we to do, yeah? Mm -hmm. Now, that's another, um, what Una da do, D-A, mm -hmm. which because <laughs> The word be 
would not be used when speaking Gullah Geechee um, or old time Gullah Geechee. Um, and duh, DA would be used. Now, as I, I explained earlier, one thing learned from the translators, uh, translators was that the, and in the New Testament would be DE because it's a derivative of the, duh, a translation of duh. Um, and DA would be the form of the verb be. Now, um, there are a number of young adults speaking Gullah, writing Gullah. They use DA for T-H-E, which is kind of strange to me because of the orthography I learned from the translation team. But um, it's, I am accepting, I'm accepting of it because they're making use of the language right. in the way that is familiar to them. Thank y'all for that quick lesson. Do we have one more question before I turn it over to the Kuti Vini team? One last question for Mr. Ron and Emery. How do y'all think developing an official writing system for Gullah Geechee could further preserve both the language and the culture? I think a written language makes it real and authentic. Now, um, recently, I developed um, their, uh, I call it the Geechee Literature Series. Uh, there are two novellas that um, I've written. Turtle Dove done Drooped His Wings um, uh, and uh, A Gullah Tale of Fight or Flight. And we wear the mask, Unraveled Truths in a Pre-Gullah Community. But I call them the Geechee Literature Series because <laughs> the words Geechee and literature at one time would have been considered an oxymoron. Geechee and literature. Yeah. Geechee or Gullah was something to be studied about those people who lived somewhere. But literature means that it's real. <laughs> It exists, it's contemporary. And to showcase that uh, it is a living culture, um, a living heritage that even to this day, 2023, people speak this, people observe these customs <laughs> and beliefs. And that is what makes it real when people can read it and say, oh, this is not from some 200, 300, 800 years ago. And this is not from a period of the reconstruction era or even before then, mm -hmm. um, from the period of slavery. Yeah. This is the way that the people live. This is the way that they speak. This is the way they speak about the lives that they live. And that's the importance of having the written word of Gullah Geechee. Mm -hmm. Thank you to our Sea Island Translation team just for sharing and dropping that knowledge on us. I'm about to switch it over to Akuti Vani. I just love saying it. <laughs> um, team, so Cliff, based on your experiences developing the writing system for Louisiana Creole, what are some things the language activists in the Gullah Geechee community should keep in mind when trying to organize people around the issue of developing a Gullah Geechee orthography? Akua, Erica. Would y'all mind horribly if I mention the, if, no, not, not even that. You can get that ready if you want, but I would love to just first comment on some of the things I've heard, if I may. Y'all don't understand how eerily beautiful, <laughs> how uncanny our experience that we all three of us agree there are so many, I don't even want to say parallels to the, the linguistic and cultural situation amongst the Gullah Geechee here. They're not even parallels. They're identical to what is happening to Kurivini or Louisiana Creole in uh, Louisiana and, and, and throughout the Creole diaspora where we have other Creoles. Where there's tons of Creoles in Texas and California. I live in California myself. I'm from Louisiana. There's uh, all, all from Louisiana to the West. And everything y'all have said is literally verbatim 
everything that is said in our communities. Mm. Uh, I hope Louisiana Creole for a time and even maybe among some today was considered, please excuse my language, but I want to be frank and mm-hmm. say what it is. It has been for a long time called nigger French. Mm-hmm. It's been for a long time called broken French. It's been called not the real stuff. There's several things. And there was, I, I talked a little bit about it yesterday. Um, in 1915, uh, you see a, a, a strong push towards getting people to learn to speak, well, making people speak English. And in 1921, that will become a state mandated law where you were not allowed to educate children in the language that they knew at home. Mm-hmm. In fact, you know, you think about a lot of Louisiana Creoles at the time. You know, young boys, 15, 16, would be working at home with their fathers. And then at at this time, they're also mandated to go to school and to be instructed in a language they never heard of, let alone knew, and then have to do it within the same grade level as as, is common for their age. Um, And so then they come home and you have the parents telling them, no, don't, don't speak that here. Listen, no, you. And then they use Creole as the grown folk language. And they wanted them to have, they wanted the younger generations to have a fighting chance at a successful life. So they didn't teach it. I'm the first person that we know of. um, I wasn't raised speaking Kudivini, but it was such a passion that for me to learn it because I felt robbed of a a very important cultural element that is my birthright. Mm -hmm. I'm the first person I think that we know of that has literally taught myself to speak the language about 21 years ago. And ever since then, I've been fighting to teach it. Mm-hmm. Um, so That's I just want to thank y'all. To, it, just hearing, too, that we're not alone with it. Mm-hmm. Hearing that um, the, pres- the, the the efforts of preservation y'all have made, it's just, it's really beautiful. Y'all, you just don't know. And I'm sure they'll they'll speak to it, too. Adrian, Adrienne has a lot of stories of, about the same stuff. Um, mm-hmm. Oliver just was telling us wh- this morning. But while we were downstairs in the preparation room about one such story. So, but yeah, um, directly to the question, though, um, what are some things to keep in mind? Uh, it seems you guys have already encountered it. You, you've you already dealt with um, a lot of the things to keep, to keep in mind. Um, and when creating an orthography, I would say um, I'll give you a couple examples. There is a lot of variation in Kurivini. Um, it varies sometimes regionally. And then within those regions, from household to household, you can find somebody speaking differently. Mm-hmm. So accounting for the variations, and in, in, uh, th- I'll go to my next point, and then that'll tie in with accounting for the variations. Um, we had we made it, I don't think that we made it clear enough in our current version of the orthography that what we were attempting to do was to standardize the orthography or the writing system and not standardize the language. Because just what you guys said that you encountered with the Bible, well, we wouldn't say it that way. We wouldn't say it that way. And so what we did, uh, what we we sought out to do was to give you a set of uh, of of standards and rules that can be applied to the spellings that you guys for the different words that you encounter in everyday life. And some people have um, differences in, in aesthetically, you know, some of the sounds that we use for writing system um, have a bit of the same sound. And again, certain regions will use one sound over another. Um, but what we attempted to do was take the etymology of the word. Much of our vocabulary overwhelmingly is French or comes from French. So um, some of the sounds can can interchange a little bit. So that's the first thing I would encourage you uh, is to maybe standardizing the writing system, because in languages like ours, it's not we don't have. Uh, academies, like there's the Académie Française, is, is that what it's called? Where there's a set of people that makes the rules on not what is appropriate spelling or orthography, but what is appropriate French. And, you know, and we don't have that in English. And we don't want that. We love the, the intricacies and the complexities and the differences in, in the variations in our languages. And so one of the things that was a little difficult was getting some of the members of the community, because just like you said, well, my grandmother, she wouldn't say that like that. And so 
literally everything y'all said. But so we didn't try to force on you what your grandmother would say. We tried to to give you a means of writing down effectively where it would be understood in in writing at least what Grammy Grammy me would say. Um, I'll give you another example. Um, so demonstratives, demonstratives. So some of you that don't know may are um, they are uh, this and that, these and those, these type of words that demonstrate that that point out a difference between two things. Um, we chose to present because there is so much variation in demonstratives in Kurivining. We chose to present some that you can argue we tended to standardize, but that was merely so, and I'll, I'll, I'll tell you, um, the word for this is sila. The word for that is sala. And in classic West African ling linguistic fashion, they are uh, post-nominal, they're placed behind the noun. And then one of the ways you can say these is silaye. The other is salaye. Now this changes wherever you go. <laughs> In Louisiana, you can hear la la ye, you can hear uh, la la ye, you can hear uh, sa la ye. But what we felt in this particular instance that at least these four versions provided a consistent, a, a consistent means for people to see it and know what we were talking about when they say it. That way, uh, I'll, I'll go off into another linguistic thing. Whenever you see ye, typically, except in one case, whenever you see ye, it's typically dealing with plurality. So it's understood why someone would say, oh, may, may, shash, shay, get those chairs over there. You could also say shash, uh, la tab, la ye. And it's just kind of understood in context because you have that pluralizer. But again, these things vary from community to community. So we chose some that offered stability and consistency to prevent, to uh, let people know, to teach it, but also to say, hey, you are going to hear variation. And we're not suggesting that you use, we're not forcing this version upon you, but we want to give you a place to start, as especially as new learners. Because something y'all have that, that we don't is that our language is already endangered. You know, it's estimated, and Oliver may talk about this more, but it's estimated that between five and 10,000 people still speak it, that he'll tell you about how that number is really hard to know for a lot of reasons. But we're already endangered. And so we have, there's a, a push to learn. There's a lot of younger people learning the language these days. I've taught uh, many of them myself over the last 15 years. And um, they're, they're, with the, the age of social media that we're in now, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's easier. But that's one of the things that becomes very confusing for new learners is, well, how do we know which one to say? You got to get with your elders. That's, now, that's one thing they don't like to do. And I'm, I'm glad to have been raised in that lad in the 80s era because uh, I still, you know, I came up where I can appreciate not having cell phones and stuff. So I love talking to my grandmother, mm. love talking to my elders. Um, they don't have that as much today, I see, because we still do have elders who speak it, but it's very hard to get our younger generation to engage with them. So what I find fascinating about your situation here is that y'all kids already speak it in, in, in great number. So yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you for that, Cliff, yes. dropping that knowledge on us as well. I'm going to come back to you with this next question is for Oliver. What are some of the linguistic aspects to consider when writing in unwritten language? Thanks. Yeah, it, it's interesting because when we started the creating the orthography guide for Louisiana Creole, um, I was an undergrad in linguistics at the time. And one of the things that from a perspective of academic linguists that people always say is we want to have um, a phonetic writing system. We want to have one sound um, and one symbol. So every sound that's meaningful in the language, you want to have one symbol representing that sound. And I quickly learned that all this stuff that had been taught in textbooks and in, uh, you know, in school had really no bearing on the reality of because the, the main point is that when you write a language, you can hear me? Okay. When you write a language, it's a visual representation of something that otherwise we only hear 
Mm. It's something that makes it tangible and makes it into a symbol. You know, not only the the writ, even the the book itself is an object which represents the language. So it becomes so much more than linguistics. Actually, it's mostly not about linguistics. And especially nowadays, um, you know, one of the things that linguists used to be worried about is how many accent marks are you going to put um, on a word? Or, you know, we have some accent marks we put on uh, words in Louisiana Creole. But now it's much easier than formerly to include accent marks Whereas yeah. in the era of typewriters or early computation in the 90s, early 2000s, it was more complicated. Now it's not really a problem. So the linguistic aspects, um, in my mind, become less and less important the further down the road you go of developing a writing system. And I don't know if you would agree with that. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you for that. Dixon, next question is for Adrian. What do orthography users need? For example, how do you go from orthography to creating curriculum, learning, and teaching tools? Um, well, first of all, you need to know what your goals are. And if you're going to be teaching informally or formally, when I got started learning, I say relearning the language because I grew up hearing the language in my household but we weren't encouraged to speak the language um, because uh, it was the belief, and it's not just in my household, but it was just a general belief that uh, you won't do well in school because uh, as was already mentioned here, my grandmother, she was in school and they weren't encouraged that, well, they couldn't speak the language in school and had a, uh, some of her generation had a hard time, not everybody, but some of her generation had a hard time. And so they didn't want their children to have a hard time um, in school and being educated. Mm -hmm. But my grandparents moved to Chicago and they left their children with their, their parents. Mm -hmm. My mother stayed with uh, mm -hmm. my grandmother's mother and my uncles, they were with my grandfather's parents. And so my, my great grandmother, she didn't really speak English. Uh, she spoke a little bit. And so that's how <laughs> my mother being born in her generation spoke both uh, Louisiana French and uh, Kuribini. And so when we moved to Chicago, we weren't encouraged to speak the language. So I had to, although I knew some words and some phrases and things like that, I had to relearn the language. And so the first thing that we did as a family, we would get together on sun, for Sunday dinners and we would uh, gather together and eat and speak the language. And we would tell the younger people, oh, you can't eat until you tell us what's the name of that. Oh. <laughs> And so uh, we, after that, we, uh, we played games. Uh, we developed a, a, a set of uh, cards, like crazy eights, you know, children games, so that we could uh, speak the language in conversation. Oh, and we also, uh, because food is such a big thing for us, <laughs> we, we also got together and wrote um, recipes and things that we remembered uh, how our parents and, and, and grandparents would cook. And we wrote those recipes down in uh, Kudivini for the family. So we made it uh, something that they could relate to. And we would have the younger, uh, our, our children would get together and they would have conversations. Uh, in terms of formally, I, I worked with uh, I worked with these two and, and other people to develop uh, uh, infographs and and memes and things like that. And I used I would look at uh, curriculum that's available, uh, like Common Core and different things like that. Uh, but I also look at the local curriculum of Louisiana and say, well, okay, well, what age, what, what, what is it that the children are supposed to know, supposed to know at this particular age group? And that works well, but you all, uh, I, I made sure that uh, I incorporated some things about and aspects of the culture, because we do have uh, folk tales that were written. They were written using French orthography, but 
we switched those into the Kudivini orthography and uh, music and proverbs and things like that. So that those things are incorporated into <laughs> the curriculum itself. And just to back up, we call the language Kudivini. And it's probably a new term for you guys here. You may have heard Louisiana Creole, but Kudivini is a way that people in the Bayou Tesh area of Louisiana, they, they would refer to the language. And that was just a way for them to say, we don't speak, uh, we don't speak uh, Creole like them. They speak that, mm. that Kudivini, which is Mokuri Mobini, which is I, I, I go, I come. Mm -hmm. I spell as opposed that. to K O U R uh, I, I uh, hyphen B I N I. Mm. V, I think I'm uh, V yes. as in Victor. Yes, V I N I. Okay. And so, because in Louisiana, there's such a uh, what people refer to the language in different ways. <laughs> they will call it Louisiana French, or they will call it Cajun French, or Creole French, or French Creole, or just Creole, or just French. And in uh, naming it that way, it's not really necessarily telling you which language is spoken in the home. People who identify as Cajun will call their language Cajun French. And that means they might be speaking Louisiana French or they may be speaking Louisiana Creole. Mm -hmm. But because they identify <laughs> as Cajun, they call it Cajun French. And the same thing happens for those who identify as Creole. So if they identify as Creole, they may call the language they're speaking. Oh, my grandmother used to speak Creole French or French Creole when in actuality, their grandmother was actually speaking Louisiana French mm. and not Louisiana Creole. <laughs> and it's not, you know, so exactly. there's no rhyme or reasoning to who spoke what, when, where, how. Uh, and so especially for younger people who never heard the language growing up, uh, it's difficult for them to know what language their uh, grandparents actually spoke or great grandparents actually spoke. They just know how they identified the language. And most of the time back in the day, they just said, we speak French. Mm -hmm. And that could mean, and they knew <laughs> themselves, like this is Creole, but um, that's been created on that you know, that's, that's how, and so we use the name Kuti Bini because there's no doubt we're talking about the language because people even identify as Louisiana, Creole and um, the identity does not necessarily mean they speak that particular language. Mm -hmm. okay. So uh, in developing curriculum, uh, when I, yes. I just wanted you to uh, point out some of the memes that I pulled up. That's <laughs> I sent up some of your memes. And this is uh, one she created. Uh, yes, that was one uh, talking about uh, Comparatives and superlatives in Kudivini, taller, easier. Uh, so, yeah. And that, I think that one just might have been Christo. Yeah, yeah, so uh, just, uh, just, uh, it. Mm -hmm. just different ways. You know how in uh, in in American we we say, I don't know. I was just saying. Just so saying. Just ways that we could translate that into. Um, could it be me, which is just more like me, which is just my just opinion. My, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. She could Oh, yeah. Some she fauna. I took, yeah, I took that uh, picture around my house. Actually, I live in Chicago now, but my grandparent, my, uh, my grandmother especially would drink that, that type of coffee. Mm. <laughs> so I just found that interesting. Yeah. This is, uh, this is one of my students um, who I, I told him it's a great idea. You want to label stuff. And actually, she homeschools her children. She's got about three or four of them. And she teaches them. She has built in Kudivini into her homeschooling curriculum for her children. And so they label everything around the house. Mm. And then uh, this is from uh, our other co colleague, Dr. Christoph Landry, who this is really all four of the... Uh, Latin-based languages that you hear in Louisiana. So there's Kudivini, 
well, not all four, that's English. I voted, j'ai voté in French, he votado in uh, Spanish, and then moté voté, which is curivini. In Louisiana Spanish. Lu in Louisiana Spanish, yeah. <laughs> he votado. Wow. Boy. Yeah. So this, these are things where, you know, we're providing for the community. So you, in all, I think that's another thing that's important is to have it in all aspects of life, right? Politics yeah. are important. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Chicory coffee is important. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so uh, just exposing it to them to, to have them realize you can talk about more things than just I don't know, you might think talking to your elders are boring, but are you into, I don't know, you, music of today's day. God mm -hmm. bless you. But <laughs> mm -hmm. getting around that conversation, but you know, you you can talk to them up and, and all of these different things and providing resources for um, for them to be able to speak in, in these different topics. And unlike uh, uh, the situation you guys are in, our younger people, they don't speak the language. so. Uh, we developed a memorized course, which is sort of like Duolingo, um, but you can do your own uh, your own courses, and that's really popular for a lot of people who can't take a class and don't have time. They can just pull out their their cell phone and and do a couple of lessons uh, on memorize and, and try to at least learn the vocabulary. And we always encourage people. Uh, even if you're learning, like I learned uh, basically because the orthography was phonetic. And once I got those sounds down, I was able to read uh, everything mm -hmm. because it was phonetic. Every, every sound has its own symbol as, as Oliver was saying, and uh, it made it much easier for me. Uh, this, it's not easy for everyone, Mm -hmm. And so when you're teaching, you have to keep that in mind. Also, there's going to be people who's going to people who will struggle uh, with trying to read mm -hmm. the language and people who just want to know how to speak the language. So all of those things uh, we have to keep in in mind. Um, yeah, mm -hmm. <laughs> I think that's it. <laughs> Thank y'all for sharing that. Cliff, this next question is for you. Okay. Based on your experiences in developing the writing system for Louisiana Creole, what role do community members play in the development of a writing system for a language like Gullah Geechee? You know, I th that's a, such an important question. I think the community members play the most important role. You know, we who came together to do this, you won't hear Oliver, I'm always going to say it, Oliver, you know, because he grew up on the other side of the pond, you're not going to hear him say he's a Louisiana Creole. He is, he's of Louisiana Creole descent, his, uh, on his dad. So, but, you know, you just, in our particular case, you just happen to have a set of people who are knowledgeable, who worked very hard, who, had, who gained the appropriate set of expertise in order to offer something like this to the community. But it wasn't, necessarily our choice we had to consider things like in our case our creole language is a french-based creole language um not many people uh well there's a lot of people who speak french in louisiana but the people who were our target audience were largely not french speakers so this is one of the reasons why, um, which I'll probably talk about it later, I think there's a question, but this is why other orthographies, one of the reasons other orthographies didn't really work for us. So we had to see what is the need? Who, who are we catering to? We're catering to largely people of Creole descent or actual Creoles simply who've lost the language, but they don't speak French. Some of them may have had it a little bit French in school, wasn't Louisiana French when they were coming up, may have had it in third grade. So they're not familiar with the writing system. Um, also, we just felt like their overall voice was important. What did they, the, the language attitudes, what they feel about the language. I think you said, you struck gold, Mr. Ron, when you said that orthography makes it real. Resources make it real. People really started to look. I, I saw the difference in the, the attitude shifting around Kurivini once we came out with the orthography. Now, we had been using it some years prior. Um, my other colleagues and I, who had uh, really kind of laid the, the foundational work for the guide, um, 
we started some years earlier. We had played with uh, with prototypes of what we have today, and we saw the community response. One of the things that we deal with in Louisiana, this is, I might get in trouble, but I, I, I've been doing it 21 years, so I'm going to just call it like I see it. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> um, in Louisiana, especially among not all, but many Creoles of color, there is a tendency and sometimes a deep-seated need to identify with Europeanness. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So we used to call ourselves prior to this movement um, and I, I largely Christoph is responsible for the, a lot of you just you hear more so Creole now. Oh, that's a Creole part. He Creole, she's Creole. You used to hear a lot of, oh, we're French Creoles. There's just something about that beautiful word French mm -hmm. that it just makes it all the more better. Mm -hmm. If you're I'm a French mm -hmm. Creole. Mm -hmm. Don't speak the language. Mm -hmm. Don't. You know, the, the, all that they really have, and a lot of for a lot of Louisiana Creoles who don't speak the language, what they have is their association, their uh, being descendants, in some cases, not all, of the French. Yeah. And so, um, and, and again, by no means am I saying this is all Louisiana Creoles. It's definitely not the case for myself that I have to be associated with that. Definitely not the case for Adrienne, but there are many. And so, could you need just the title alone? Uh, us deciding to uh, just a little bit more about that term. She's already explained to you how it gets his name. Um, people wanted to chop our heads off when we we wanted to. We not we didn't force anybody, but we proposed for the reasons Adrian has uh, listed and others that let's start using the word could uh, because it's a local term to describe a local language. Um, we are not French people. We have not been French for hundreds of years. Right. We have nothing really in common with the French except for a set of vocabulary. We're very different people. And so this marriage to the term French, we thought was a little problematic. It also, as Adrienne pointed out, created a lot of uh, uh, linguistic confusion with the way that people identify versus the language that we speak. So just Kudivini in and of itself, uh, or French Creole, sorry, in and of itself, just for, it was so problematic. And one of the, the biggest things was just really helping people to divorce that idea of Frenchness. Right. In Louisiana. Is that you? Yes. Uh, yes. yes. <laughs> That's exactly what it is. You want to share what I said? <laughs> yeah. Colin, get it. Thank you for sharing. Colonizer and in, in, um, fatuation. That's what it is. Colonizer and fatuation. Exactly. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> I love that. This next question is for Oliver. How do linguistic requirements differ from community requirements and how can they be reconciled? <laughs> well, I think we heard so much about what's at stake in Louisiana. Um, and, you know, that has nothing to do with linguistics in the sense that you can't read that in some kind of textbook or, you know, if somebody comes from outside of Louisiana, typically they characterize this whole situation as complex, complicated, et cetera, because it's difficult to understand from an Anglo-American perspective. Um, and we have so much going on and much of that is tied to questions as, as you can kind of hear in the undertone to all of this, it's all about race as well. Mm -hmm. And we have a very complex situation if, if you come from an Anglo-American perspective, because Louisiana Creole as a language has also been and is spoken by white people, many of whom deny that they speak that language mm -hmm. and they call it Cajun French. And I know that very, very well, because when I speak to white people in Creole, I have to be very, very careful what I call the language. Mm -hmm. Now, that seems, you know, on one sense like a, uh, a sociological or social <clears throat> phenomenon, but that feeds directly back into how we have to deal with putting the language on the page. Mm. Because there are many people who would like Louisiana Creole to be written 
as if it were a version of broken French for exactly this idea that because that therefore, even if it's a broken version of French, at least it's French, mm -hmm. at least it's European, <laughs> at least it doesn't, you know, imagine itself as something different and new. Um, and the issue of the apostrophe, for example, that Dr. Ron already mentioned, that had been a big one in the improvised French-based spellings of Curivini, which were used prior to the development of the Curivini orthography. So when the term in the question was uh, reconciled, reconciliation, we had a lot of arguments and we continue to have a lot of arguments with all different kinds of people mm -hmm. who lay all different kinds of claims to the language and what it means. Um, I have to say that the, the worst of them are those who actually don't speak the language, who are not really involved mm -hmm. in the language scene at all, but who come in from the outside and are, you know, making assumptions basically about how the language should be uh, symbolized. Mm -hmm. um, so I think actually, you know, what I learned, and I guess we all learned that in a way, that we have to sit down and talk to one another. And sometimes we have to have really difficult conversations mm -hmm. to, to get to that orthography guide that we had produced. We had so many hours and hours and hours of discussions and phone calls and emails and really, you know, arguments sometimes. But the thing that we always had that I remember that, and you know, we need women. Yes. <laughs> Because it was a bunch of guys on that team. There was no woman on that team. Yeah. And there was a lot of butting heads. Yeah. I have to say that. Um, and one thing that you always say, Adrian, is that no family. That we are, we are kind of a family. We are family. So in a family, you have arguments, right? Mm -hmm. You you get annoyed at each other and you butt heads and you're taking up the same space and Relationship. someone wants to be the big brother and all of that. But mm -hmm. at the end, you get together and you sit down and you eat together and you make up. So that I think is how we went around that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, this is our Creole matriarch. This yeah. <laughs> matriarch of our Creole family. Dadla. Thank y'all for that. Um, this next question, Oliver Cliff. Will you expand on three heritage languages in Louisiana and what sets Kuri Bani apart from Louisiana French in terms of African influences of the language? You want to take it? Oh, I thought it was first. Either, either, either or. Oh, go ahead, Cliff. You can this. Sure. Uh, can you repeat it one more time for me, though? Yes. Will you expand on three heritage languages in Louisiana and what sets Kuri Bani apart from Louisiana French in terms of African influences of the language? Okay. Um, so Louisiana does have three Latin-based heritage languages. There's Louisiana French, mm. there's Louisiana Spanish, and then there's Curibini. I think what we should do is, is you talk about Louisiana French and Louisiana Spanish, because uh, you did it so eloquently yesterday. And I'll do, uh, I'll talk about the Curibini oh, portion. Yeah, and, like uh, yeah. Okay, yeah. So um, Louisiana Spanish, <laughs> you'll, you'll almost never hear about, um, there were a group of people who came from the Canary Islands and um, they came in the late um, 1700s while Louisiana was under the control of the Spanish. And their descendants today speak what they usually call their, um, their variety of Spanish, Ileño, which is kind of like a language of the islands, um, or Brule Spanish. Or there's also some people who, who spoke Adaiseño. So these are just different designations for different areas of that Canary Island Spanish. But it's very hard to find any. I mean, I've never met somebody. Mm, maybe you once you can find a couple, a couple of people yeah. but they're very very elderly people who can still speak spanish mm -hmm. in that way of course there are many other people who speak spanish in louisiana who arrived more recently um as for louisiana french um i think the the really nice way of conceptualizing it is as a a kind of a sister language to curivini mm -hmm. um it's a dialect of French that also grew up in Louisiana because when people were coming to Louisiana to colonize the territory from France, French as a language was not constructed yet. It did not exist in that standardized codified sense that is now ruled over by the Académie Française. 
So these people were coming speaking different regional dialects and different regional languages from the French hexagon, um, which coalesced into, Louis into Louisiana French over several uh, decades. So it's not the case that Louisiana Creole really developed out of Louisiana French, but they actually both grew up uh, side by side to some extent, yeah. So yeah. go ahead with the Curivini. Okay. And so you take that, uh, like Oliver said there, there's a, a misconception that Curivini comes from Louisiana French, but it is indeed a sister language that came up roughly around the same time. Um, Curivini has retained a lot of uh, Africanisms in the syntax, or are we talking about the ordering of words, also subject, verb, agreement, that, thing, that type of thing. Um, one of the most... I think uh, African influences that we've retained in Kurivini is we have post-nominal articles, which is to say that our articles, the, the, our definite articles, they go behind the noun. Um, so yesterday I gave a, a couple of uh, examples. I'll, I'll go to a different piece of that and then we'll come back around. I'm going to teach you guys a little Kurivini. That's all right. Mm -hmm. All right. So uh, before I get back to the post-nominal articles, we'll talk about a lot of nouns that we have in Louisiana. So our word names, many of them, uh, I would, if I had to guesstimate, I'd 95%, maybe 90% are what we call agglutinated, which is when two different parts of speech get permanently affixed to one another to create a new word. So for instance, the uh, the feminine table in French is a feminine noun. So you would use the article la, meaning the, with table. So in French, if you were to say the table, you would say la table. So what happens in Louisiana is that the enslaved Africans who were, you know, under French rule and, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, French, captive by French people, French colonizers, when they would hear um, table being referred to, they would often hear it with la table. You know, not really, you probably don't have a lot of tables at the time in the, in the house. So you would hear la table. And so that became one word for table. So the word in Kurivini for table is la table. The same is true for house, la maison. That becomes one word, la maison. Then the African influences that, that uh, we've retained, again, back to the post-nominal determiners, are when the, 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 the or determiner comes behind the noun now. The determiner, in this case, there's debate. It's debatable whether or not it's from an African, uh, I think maybe Wolof or Bamba. One, uh, one of these West African languages, the word is la for the, the determiner of the, but the same is, it's also the word for the in French. Nevertheless, it's hyphenated in our writing system. We hyphenate it and put it behind the noun. So the table becomes la table la, is how you say the table. Table the, essentially. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And then the same is true for the, uh, the demonstratives I talked about earlier. Sila, meaning this. Sala, meaning that. So if I wanted to say this table, what would I say? There we go. There we go. Two points to Gryffindor. All right. What about that table? La Tab Sala. There you go. There you go. So these are just a, a couple of things. Uh, and another example is, again, like I mentioned, the syntax. It's closer to English and uh, West African languages in that um, a really clear example is the the uh, sentence I see him uh, in French that is je le vois okay so je is the pronoun meaning I le is the object him and then vois is the verb so essentially if you were to say that uh, using the same syntax but using English vocabulary you would be saying I him see well that's not done in Kurivini. It's done, it's done the exact same way as in English, exact same way as many African languages that it comes, that, you know, has influenced it. You say mo wa li, and automatically there, we even have a difference in vocabulary in that particular instance. So, yeah, just a couple examples. Wow. Thank you both, both for that. Yes. This next question is for Adrian. <laughs> what roles do the community and educators play in orthography development? Well, uh, 
first of all, you have to ask a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of questions. Hmm. Um, of course, they developed the orthography and the orthography was being developed over a series of years uh, before they even uh, put it together on paper as an orthography guide. And even then, when you're using the orthography, uh, they're, they're still, and as they were saying, they were debating about what they should do, what they should not do, and they still do it. And, you know, they will still <laughs> do it. And so, you know, if I'm developing resources, and then one person said, well, you know, I told you that that's what we should have done and, you know, a long, long time ago. But um, in asking those questions, it helps to uh, refine the orthography guide. Mm -hmm. um, so that next time when they, they get together and they want to update it, then they say, well, you know, we've been having an issue with this part right here. So let's uh, 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 see if we can look at that again and see what might be a better way to uh, express that on paper. Um, the other thing that the community members uh, uh, role that they play is uh, developing uh, resources, developing resources. Now, whether it's for through a church organization, we have uh, really a person that uh, one that's one of our uh, role models, Herbert Wills, who uh, he's been having uh, meetings with people through his his church. And once the pandemic hit, he started having um, uh, meetings to teach the language online. And uh, you have schools. Uh, we really haven't had a curriculum done for schools. They have been uh, in in Louisiana. Uh, people are uh, just really seeing the value in teaching Kudivini, uh in schools. Louisiana French was always, I guess, foremost and most important in terms of trying to relay that information to the younger people. But now we have schools that are uh, interested in a, in a curriculum. But as uh, was mentioned earlier, you need teachers who know the language. Mm -hmm. And that's been a difficult thing for us because you may have people that speak French <clears throat> and sometimes you have people who speak French and they take a couple of lessons in Kudivini and like magic, they know the language and they're <laughs> trying to teach the language. And we have like social media stars also. <laughs> social media stars that learned a little bit and you know they're they're really going viral and everything, but if uh <laughs> without a lot of depth to 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 their knowledge. So yeah. that's some of the things yeah. that <laughs> I like so, <laughs> yeah. so that, eloquent. Yeah, that you have to. Um, <laughs> but you know, I, I will say even in like the 10 year span of when I first started to uh, learn the language and now now we have uh, TV Creole, uh, which is a guide to learning the language. Mm -hmm. uh, we have the Chambo organization that's devoted it, uh, to the language itself. We have a lot of organizations in Louisiana that's devoted to culture mm -hmm. and language is a part of it. But Chambo is uh, devoted to just uh, Kudibini, just the Kudibini language. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of roles that people um, can play in, in the community uh, as far as uh, schools, churches, within their homes. So. Yes. Can Thank I tag you. on it? Oh, yes, yes, yeah, please. Um, it, she mentioned something very important that has been instrumental in uh, Kudivini and Louisiana French surviving. La Tab. Y'all just learned La Tab. That was actually a good one. So a La Tab, these are what we call our meetup groups. So different organizations, sometimes churches, sometimes, um, like she said, our good elder and friend, uh, Mr. Herbert Wilts. He hosts these latabs. They're just a space for people just to get together and talk, talk about whatever, talk about your day, what you're going to eat after this meeting, just to just to talk. And it really grabs the attention of people who are wanting to learn. In you guys' case, everybody speaks it. Don't nobody really need to learn it, but I, it would probably help to to 
valorized it and to, to validate it as an actual language, like we talked about, a space where people are intentionally meeting up to speak Gullah Geechee. Oh, this must be special. So yeah, Latabs and whatever you call them, I think the English term is just meetup group, but we call them Latabs. Thank you for uh, bringing that up. Oh, awesome. So she's in, so she's going to pull up um, the orthography guide um, <clears throat> that we created. It also happens to be on the website that, um, that she mentioned, chambo.org, which we're both founding members of, by the way. And um, you can find it uh, on Chambo, and it means to hold on, C-H-I-N, as a Nancy, B-O dot org. And we have our uh, website done in both English and in Kurivini. So that would be a, a good thing for you. So this is the orthography guide. We do a brief introduction here about how, um, <clears throat> you know, the linguistic situation. Here is uh, the alphabet and the consonants. And uh, Oliver, you want to talk about some of this? Go ahead. Okay. Okay, so yeah, um, you can go back to that page, if you will. These are going to be some of the most important things in, in Kurivini are our um, nasals. Kurivini is a very nasal language. We have a variety of, uh, we have eh, uh, uh, uh. all of these sounds will appear in almost every word that you'll encounter. So um, having some, we have the approximates, which are um, the examples in the English language that that are closest to what that sound sounds like, so that you can, you know, if you don't have any a teacher and you're trying to do this on your own, you can um, get an idea of what these sound like. And so Oliver, of course, was instrumental in this in, in this portion of it. Um, being the only one of us who was a degreed linguist, you know, and he he was master for work because the way we had it before it worked. But I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, Oliver, a, a lot of what you contributed also was so that it could be accessible, so that it's primarily for the communities learning it, but also accessible to the world of linguistics and acceptable, quote unquote, in linguistics. We had to manage that because sometimes linguists. And I'm not saying that's necessarily the case in, in Louisiana, but sometimes <laughs> linguists could look at stuff that's created by communities and dismiss it if it doesn't have the appropriate scientific framing in their view. Mm -hmm. okay, that's their view. So we had to keep a little eye on that, too. OK, yeah. And if you go to, um, yeah, here's the more nasals. Homonyms, we go over how we do all this. I would like to go to capitalization. No, nope, not that one. Keep going. Well, look, go back to that last page. Uh, I really here's the the example that I gave you earlier. I wish uh, my people right here could see a little bit better. So you have we have about two identifiable distinct dialects of Kurivini, um, and within those two dialects, you'll still find um, variation among them. And so if you're looking at this this bottom right portion on the right page right here, yes, Cebu Xil. So yeah, the post the Pronominals. So this is a more Gallicized or quote unquote Frenchy way that some people will speak Kurivini. And it, you find it typically among the Bayou Tesh, which is an area uh, that uh, Adrienne mentioned earlier. And so this is more common in that region. And then uh, the post nominals, like we talked about, there's another region. So we didn't want to stifle people from being able to, to learn the variety, to learn the dialect or variation that they wanted to speak. Um, another thing that I think was really cool is that can't be the last page, is it? Because it looked like when you turned over. Okay, well, then it's the, okay, wait, stop. There we go. The abbreviations was something to think about. Um, we wanted this to be a bona fide language, right? So we have, um, you know, titles, Mr., Mrs., and, you know, we envisioned a world where, and I do a lot of translations for Cigna Health Insurance right now. In, in fact, uh, I've been doing translations for about 15 to 16 years, and it just astonished me that either people were requesting uh, these resources um, in our language or that the company just said, you know, they know that there's a population of people who speak it, so let's just make sure that we have all of like legal documents and stuff that you get when you get your explanation of benefits 
from your health insurance company when you get your summary of benefits. Well, they started translating those into Kudivini some years ago. And I'm, I, I think I'm the only one who's ever done those. And so it's helpful to have abbreviations like Mr. or Mrs. Sure, we have these words for it, but we never thought about how would we would just do we just write it out or no, every system has abbreviations because what it does, it, it, it shortens things, you know, makes your word count a little smaller. But again, it gives a, to me, it just gives an extra little sense of pride that this is a bona fide language. We have the same thing that every language has. We have abbreviations for things. Um, and they were well thought out, I think. We even um, have abbreviations for like um, um, time zones. La la pe, we say now that was a neologism. Oh, that's really good to talk about. Neologisms. Um, neologisms are, and I don't know that you guys have that that issue, but neologisms are are, are new crea created words that maybe you don't have words for that need to be expressed in the language. Um, and so there's often the, like internet, Inter oh yeah, internet is a great one. So we started to call the internet Place La Toile. Um, la Toile in Kurivini is, uh, is a net, like a web, the web that of, of a spider. And then we in Place is how we say space or place in Kurivini. So it's a very, you know, with internet is popular these days. So if you don't have words for things like that, th these are things you just, you know, kind of play around with, with the group of people who's, who's uh, responsible for creating it and talk about how would this be authentically said. And I find myself creating a lot of neologisms for, um, for the healthcare, but I don't like to do that alone. Uh, that, that That's something that shouldn't be up to one individual. I think it needs to be a group effort. So there's some things that... Um, I, I take a little bit of agency on because it, we have words, but we may have never heard them together, but they make perfect sense if you say it. And then other things, um, I, I consult my colleagues, like I had to come up with uh, t with a, a word for MRI, <laughs> when you break those things out, and a CT scan. So, you know, those type of things we kind of get together a little bit on. Did you receive pushback from any speakers? about these any of the creations like with the the neologisms the title, yeah or the title just like mr and mrs which hadn't been well no we had words for those we just didn't have the abbreviations for them so, but when the readers mm -hmm. read it did you receive any pushback from people or was it just readily accepted? oh <laughs> yeah we didn't receive pushback for that but the for that particular instance, but there was a lot of pushback for the, the writing system as a whole okay. because it didn't look Frenchy enough. There were, <laughs> I'm telling you, they were really, really married to the idea of French because, uh, and I think it's one of the questions that I think they wanted to talk about. If, if with permission, we can talk a little bit about it. I'll hold off. Because I can talk. You yeah, have to tell me shut up. <laughs> Thank you for that question, y'all. So now we're going to open up the floor to see if anybody in the audience has any questions for our lovely panelists. Okay. Wow. Questions for each other. Um, we all between Bella and Good question. Mm. I would say that they are synonymous, and that was a decision. I would say that they're synonymous, and that was a decision made by the Gullah Geechee Cultural Heritage Corridor Commission, because a lot of the words and expressions were similar, and there was a thought, well, as opposed to saying Gullah Speechway, Geechee Speechway here or there, it's Gullah Geechee. But there are variations. Even with that, there are variations um, throughout the corridor. I agree. Growing up, did you all think it was kind of different? But for the decision to make your cultural experience. Growing up, I was a Sea Islander. That's who I've been. Um, I ain't been I ain't been Gullah. I ain't been Geechee. No. I've been no about both of them. <laughs> they, were out, they were outsiders. They were right. outside terms. People people referred to us as Gullah. Most of the scholars. Mm -hmm. 
uh, common people refer to us as Geechees. Mm. Never knew, really with pejorative terms. And right. The way we perceive them. But with understanding, like, oh, Sea Islanders means the same thing as Gullah Geechee. It's a, it's a culture, a group of people who are Gullah Geechee. Um, uh, a, a question um, that I had, one of the questions was, um, well, well, not a question. For us, or in the writing of Gullah Geechee, contempor contemporary writing, there is this old, old time Gullah or Gullah Geechee, which was used with the, um, the translation of the Gullah Bible. And there's new or contemporary Gullah Geechee. And there's confusion of, well, it's not right, but some people may read it. Oh, that's that old time. Because one thing, like I'm looking at the, the Gullah Bible, and Jesus gone from one village to Nada, the land the people God wore. They call it 12 cycle them together. 12 cycle them. Because to make a word plural, um, you take a singular root word and add the word them. Not shoes, but shoe them. Not disciples, but disciple them. Um, but uh, contemporary speakers would say shoes. <laughs> they, wouldn't, they wouldn't say shoe them. Yeah. And they wouldn't know what, well, what are they talking about when they say shoe them? Um, and I don't know if that's something that would be an issue that you would have to deal with. Well, you said there aren't people who speak it <laughs> now. So whatever way that you write an orthography, it may not be a challenge. Well, we it, it's a, I think it, it, it gets to the question of standardization as well, because standardization could be across regions, but it could be across time. Mm -hmm. And one thing that I'm always thinking now, and that I really learn, I think, through this experience, why do we have this obsession with standardizing? I mean, you mentioned colonizer infatuation. The idea of a standard language is a way of saying, this is the correct way of speaking, this is the correct, correct way of writing, and whatever you're doing is wrong, less than. Um, so it's a continuous challenge to balance the act of writing with an, an ability to accept variation and new forms coming into the language because, you know, wonderful, thank God that there are people who are speaking it and who are continuing to innovate because language does change. The page is static, but the spoken word is flowing through time and changing. So there's a tension there. Um, so, yeah, it's a, it's a difficult one, but I think that you know, standardization, trying to box people in to which forms are legitimate or not is, is not necessary. And there are many languages throughout the world and throughout history which are not uh, standardized, but people get along fine writing. And you mentioned that people are sending text messages and writing online in Gullah mm. So that's a perfect space for this to come into existence in an in a organic way. I don't know if... That's yeah, helpful, but I think so. Well, I'll just add to that. Yeah, it, 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 and it, it, just like you saw in our orthography guide, you know, we make space, there's provision for this, this version of that and that version of it. Like, that's literally what you just said. That the, when you said boog, by the way, was the example that we use, boog is a guy or, or like a dude, you know, some, your homeboys. So I say, more boog. Um, and uh, there's a, a particular variety where it's a little bit closer to French in that you'd say say boog. And then, guys, you essentially, it's just so interesting you said that, them, the shoe them. That's essentially what we do in Kudivini. Boog ye. Guys them. It's essentially what we're saying. <laughs> it's, it's the same thing. Uh, so, yeah. And, and just making, it, having a guide, I think, because I th and language definitely does change over time. I'm one of those people who really feels like uh, what we have in our in our culture right now, people who are kind of learning in that, that Internet space, sometimes they're not being taught properly because there is a way when you look at 
learners, Kudivini can be spoken correctly or incorrectly Mm -hmm. in a manner of speaking. Mm -hmm. Um, One quick example I'll give is typically adjectives will follow French rules. There's this idea of bangs, adjectives that deal with beauty, B, age, number, like several plural, uh, gender, I'm sorry, not the goodness, goodness or badness and size. These five adjectives under the class adjectives under those classifications will come before the noun. So a good boy would be a bon boog or a bon garçon, a good guy. But if it's a, 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 a a white table, well, white comes before and that just is a rule. It, I'm sorry, it comes after. Uh, la table blanc, table white. That is a kind of an unbreakable rule in Kudivini because that just is the language. So, but what we find now is that people who, again, you know, in a net space, they get a little bit of knowledge and they think they start teaching, but they have learned things incorrectly. Wow. And now they're passing that on. So one of my passions personally is I like to, not, not for the sake of correcting people, but just to keep the language as authentic as it possibly can. Yeah. I try to make those corrections. So I think that's something for you guys uh, you could potentially do is, again, create a guide where you present both of these options. Mm-hmm. One is no more correct than the other. You know, this is maybe if it's an island, is if it's a particular island thing, St. Helena, St. Uh, John's, mm-hmm. say, hey, maybe, you know, break off what's more likely to hear in each um, variety. But I think it's so important for them to have the knowledge that, hey, you say shoes, but you know, there is a, a way that's not so tank, that's not so influenced by English um, as shoes. You can say shoot in. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, presenting that. Simple. Right. <clears throat> Thank you for that. Um, do we have any other questions from the audience? But what we can do is search on islands and specific African language in France. On which? Uh, African influence. In, on, on, in, which, in which language? Oh, okay. Oh, yes, there's a lot of research that has been done. Um, it uh, began with Lorenzo Dow Turner, our country's first African-American linguist that was done during the 1930s. Uh, and he discovered that there are numerous languages, West African languages, um, from which Gullah Geechee words originated. Also, um, even though as a child and a young adult, I did not consider myself a Gullah speaker because, you know, my parents were from Penn School. They're Penn School mm-hmm. graduates. Mm-hmm. But when I went to Hampton Institute, it wasn't so much the words, but they heard, others heard this intonation, which is because of my West African heritage. Mm-hmm. They knew I was from, not from where they were from, and I couldn't hear it. But when um, I was around uh other students from the Caribbean islands, um, uh, Jamaica, the West Indies, we would say, we carried ourselves differently. We were Islanders Mm -hmm. and we spoke differently. Um, And um, as my wife found out uh, when we were dating and she moved here from Syracuse, New York, and she thought I spoke um, eloquently, but she said, when I got upset, there was a difference <laughs> in my way of speech, all because of my African heritage. So that was, yes, there was research on numerous West African languages um, influenced Gullah Geechee speech. You should speak to that, though, pretty yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> And I'll speak really to the re- research record, which is small. You know, we, we do not have... Um, so many aspects of the language are understudied. One of the most interesting ones would be to do a study of intonation mm-hmm. in Kurivini. That would be extremely interesting and has not been done. Um, what has been researched uh, quite extensively is the, the lexicon, the vocabulary of Kurivini, 
Um, we have very good dictionary documentation that was done in the 80s and 90s. Um, we can see uh, words which are from West African languages, which are present today in, in Kurivini. And of course, as Cliff already mentioned, we can talk about grammatical, the possibility of grammatical structures which have carried over into um, Louisiana Creole Kurivini today. Uh, but really, there are only, if you're thinking really about, you know, what you want to read on that, there are only a couple of people who have written on that specific uh, aspect, unfortunately. Yeah. So uh, there's much more to be done. That's why I'm trying to get Cliff to uh, you know, come to the dark side of linguistic. Yes. <laughs> You're trying to give me the Lorenzo Doubter and bigger this. bags than I already have in my eyes. Can you all speak to me? We got here Olivier, dima kisaj apre to me. Apre mo me. Wait, apre to me. Oh, mo pa kone. Oh, microphone. Oh, oui. To gen se. Oui. Mo gen en en se en fre. Ah. E. Mo te pa kone sa. Tu te pa kone sa? No. Me no bina pe kone. Mo mo kone as maten to te di nzot. Oh, <laughs> Please. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, no, she's oh, going to, yeah, this is yeah. my sister. She's going to translate. Yeah, our interpreter. All right, I'm going to try to translate since I have been taking class from Cliff since March. But I think that Oliver said that he has one sister and one brother. And that's the gist of what they were, uh, Adrian was asking, tell us about your yourself, your family. And he said he has one sister and one brother. And then... Cliff said that he is an only child from his mother and his father. Oh. What did he say? <laughs> because he's special. Oh. Something along the lines of. What's the result? <laughs> Repeat it. Mo pa de tro. C'est pour ça que mo pa de tro. Because he's an only child, that's why he talks so much. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> wow. What a language. <laughs> what a language. Beautiful. Give it up for our interpreter. Listen, that, that's really good. Eric, I'm so, wow. Yeah. La papron, la papron bien. Learning good. Sorry. No, you're fine. Thank you. Thank y'all. We have time for one more question before we wrap up. Anybody else in the audience? I know you're probably thinking of something. And a lot of my kids, they all say, children. Mm -hmm. I think a good way of helping to develop pride within them is by not um, telling them they should not say, say it right. And um, uh, also uh, trying to get them to understand what, or asking them, how, where else have you heard that word used? And if this is grandma talk or church or church talk, then that's okay. <laughs> Um, but to real um, to understand that uh, children is the way that it should be pronounced uh, when you in you're in other spe specific settings. Let them know where, but for now it's okay. I understand you, and that helps them to know it's okay. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh. Correct. Yeah. 
<laughs> and, 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 and and like as it was said earlier, that's why having it having these languages in written texts makes it real. And you can point, okay, as was said, and and, and the teachers would know, mm -hmm. as opposed to looking only in a uh, resource guide, an academic resource guide. Okay, here, here it is used. It's okay. Just speak that way. Right. And I applaud you. <laughs> right. Yes. <laughs> Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow. Wow. <laughs> I, I think that one of the things that you, you can do too, uh, I would get with one of these brothers here and learn about other members in the community and maybe if they have some knowledge about your, your particular expertise, please have them and come in and maybe do, I don't know, an, an essay or something dealing with that particular field and do it in the language. If you're really, really passionate about it too, I would say take you a good month or two, maybe three, give it one of these teachers and come in that class and literally give the lesson in, in the language and not even say anything about it. There's, Louisiana has one, I think the second, the second largest uh, number of, of um, for education in the country. And a lot of times it, it's assumed that, um, that uh, the children are ignorant or, or uneducated. And but what they're not realizing is that you're being, but what they're not realizing is that you're you're teaching them in a language that grammatically they don't understand. They they know the words, but we speak Creole English sometimes mm -hmm. growing up, and so there is a language barrier. Mm -hmm. And teachers who are instructing our children don't understand that. Mm -hmm. So the, the more appropriate thing, when you learn to do math and reading and writing, what language you learn with? Mm -hmm. English, right? Right. So if you're learning math, reading, writing, you should, and you're a Gullah child mm -hmm. here in Gullah at home. You need to learn from Gullah. Mm -hmm. So I think mm -hmm. that would that could be something that could be beneficial. Something to think mm -hmm. about. Mm -hmm. One of the, I teach also, and one of the things that I do, and I I can't help it now. Um, oh, I can't uh, I can't help it now because I can't teach like French and Indian. Uh, the French Indian War and, and things like that without thinking about my own family and knowing how they pro uh, progressed from France to Canada to Alabama uh, and then after the war to the other side of the Mississippi to Louisiana. And so I always mention about myself and I teach in Chicago and my students are of different uh, cultural, uh, different, different, different backgrounds, mm -hmm. but showing that pride in who I am. Uh, they also, first they were like, oh, we want to go to New Orleans. Like, well, you know, I gotta, that's really, really great. I would love to go on a class trip to, to uh, New Orleans or uh, where I'm from, uh, 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 Lafayette, Louisiana. But what is your history? Mm -hmm. Tell me about yourself. Go home and talk to the oldest people in your family. Mm -hmm. And then come back and tell me what they said about, you know, mm -hmm. uh, what language they spoke, what games they played when they were younger. So just in hearing my story, I said, I want to hear your story, too. Right. And that way it's not I need to know what their what what their story is. But you come tell me your story. Mm -hmm. And so that's how. Um, and then, you know, of course, they, they know a little bit of uh, Kudubini also because I speak to them in Kudubini. So, wow. <laughs> Go sit down over there. <laughs> oh, you guys understand? They say, way, you know. In, in uh, Louisiana Creole, we say way instead of we, but yes. And uh, I had yes, one student yes. one time who. He, you know, even in, in, in when we speak American, he speaks very, very uh, uh, authentically, <laughs> uh, <laughs> proper. And so he refused to say to to say what he would say. We so the whole class would be like, "What?" And he go, "We." <laughs> 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 and 
and another student was explaining and saying, well, you know, Mrs. Chapman said it's okay to be informal with her and not say we, but he likes to be proper. Uh. <laughs> Thank y'all for that. I do have one final question for Ron, Mr. Ron and Emery. How do y'all want to see young people continue to work and what kind of support do y'all need? How do we wish to see? To see young people continue the work that y'all doing or and already work. done and what kind of support do y'all need? Mm. The work. We, uh, when I worked at Penn Center, and I think they're still continuing it, we had youth programs, youth, uh, youth programs for young school children. And I don't know that, I'm trying to remember whether or not we have language included in that, but we had all the other aspects of the culture. And I don't know today if they're continuing the language part, but I'd like to see, i like to see the language uh, continued with young people coming into those same kind of activities that we had before. I think there's a need for uh, delegation history, heritage, food finders to be a part of the school curriculum and for the teachers to be acceptable to the public. And, and that it's not just this separate unit that's taught math at this point, these number of days or a number of weeks, yes. but it's an acceptable experience for the students so that they can realize the importance of their culture. Mm -hmm. Thank you to the panelists and thank you to the audience for joining us today. <laughs> that is it. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Akua, for your support today. You've been a wonderful moderator, and I really appreciate you. And I hope that this is the beginning of many more conversations about how we can create a Gullah Geechee orthography and use that as a form of preservation for Gullah Geechee history and culture. And yeah, don't let this be the last time we get together and talk about this. We can use Avery as a space to continue this work. Y'all have people in mind that like who are you? Mr. Ron, Mr. Emery, anyone y'all have in mind that you think would be great? I, you know, I definitely think it needs to be a multi generational thing. And like y'all said, including men and women and people, you know, all people, um, however they identify to to get this uh, this project done. If y'all think it's something viable, I want Avery to support that. So thank y'all so much. You are dismissed. <laughs>